Well, as we are studying today and are continuing our series, Part 9 of Crisis and Character, looking at Joshua, we're looking at a veteran because Joshua was a veteran. He served as a soldier. And now he's phased out of that active duty of a soldier, and now he's moving into the role of a manager. And we see Joshua, the manager, this week. And then we'll finish up next week with the last part. But in this section today, we're going to be looking at chapters 13 through 21. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, we're going to be here until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I'm going to be glossing over several of those chapters pretty quickly. But today, we're going to be looking at Joshua as the manager, as he moves into a different role as they conquer the land. You see, a manager is a person who has to evaluate his own strengths and weaknesses and the strengths and weaknesses of others. Uh, as being a manager involves being able to identify blind spots and to be able to understand the process that we're all going through. Now, I think of management as not a strong point for me, but I look at my own process, I look at my strengths and my weaknesses, I often understand that my weaknesses are just a strength that have been taken to an extreme. I know that we're all in process, and the things that I've gone through have been a part of the process to conform me to make me a better manager. Early on, it's like, hey, managing's not my thing, not going to have anything to do with it. But you know something, that can only carry you for so long when you have to learn a set of skills that will take you along so that you can survive in life and thrive and move into new roles. Joshua was a slave and a soldier and a leader, and now he has to transition into the role, which may not have been a natural strength for him, but the role of managing. And today we're going to look and see how Joshua does that. But before we do that, we want to look at um, uh, a review of how God worked in his life. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, before the missions conference, uh, we saw that Joshua was the overcomer and how he con led the nation of Israel in the conquest of both the southern and the northern tribes over the kingdom, kingdoms in the land of Canaan. We saw how God intervened in a powerful way to do things and work through some circumstances of some mistakes that he made to accomplish some great strides forward in conquering the land. And so now we're moving into that time of the land has been conquered and there's a, an aspect of, of managing and distributing things. But before we get into the text today, for today, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pray with me if you would. Father, today as we are looking at Joshua character and crisis, we're seeing a different aspect. It might seem a little dry as we look at this whole aspect of the non-glamorous role of being a manager. But Lord, you have called us to be stewards of the things that you have entrusted to us. You use parables to highlight the, the importance of stewardship of, because we've been in, given a, a sacred trust and we need to manage that sacred trust well. So would you show us how to manage the different sacred trust that you have given us, whether it's a, a job or a responsibility or a marriage or family and children, whatever it might be, because we know that we have the ultimate trust of being your ambassadors to take the good news of Jesus to a lost world. So show us how to apply these principles in our lives today so that we might be more effective in your service. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the main idea that we're looking at today is that character is forged in times of crisis and its quality is revealed in times of success. We're covering this large section here, but we've looked at Joshua and crisis and character, and we've seen that his character was forged in times of crisis, in times of battle, but it's revealed in times of success. It's often when things are going good that it really reveals what's going on in our hearts and lives. Sometimes crisis can reveal our lack of character, but if we get through the crisis, the success will show whether we truly learn the lessons that we should have learned in the crisis or that we have to repeat those lessons again. You heard me say this before, and I'll probably say it again. Often people will say that they've had so many years of experience. I've had 15 years of experience or 20 years of experience, when in reality, they have one year of experience repeated 15 or 20 times. And the character reveals that they didn't learn those lessons. But for both Joshua and the people, growth in character and skills are observed through the responses to the divine directive. 
We're going to look at this in chapter 13 and a little bit of chapter 14, but the divine directive. Now, God gave Joshua a divine directive about dividing the land. And so what we're seeing here is we're seeing the managing aspect of the distribution of the resources. God had promised them this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And it was verified to be a very good land. If you remember, when Joshua sent this, the, Joshua was one of the spies who went into the land and said, it's good, let's take it. But the people didn't believe, and so they wandered for 40 years. So it was a good land. And now they've gone through the 40 years in the desert, and Joshua brings them into the land, and it is still a good land. They conquered the land under God's directive. He, he wiped out their enemies before them. Yeah, they had some baubles along the way after Jericho. They, they had some problems at Ai, but they got through that. And then the, with the, the whole uh, fiasco with the Gibeonites and, and faking like they were from a distant country and Israel entering into a treaty, but that opened up both the, the conquest of the south and of the north. Well, now they're moving to the next phase where it's the, the non-glamorous aspect. They've been through the battles. They've been through the war. And now they've got to separate the land. They've got to divide the land to distribute the resources. But here is a potential for great crisis because now the resources are available and they're going to be distributing these resources. And this, the 12 tribes of Israel that were perceived and are functioning as a nation, they came out of Egypt as a bunch of individuals, but now over the past 40 years they've become a nation. This is a critical moment. How will they respond when they have to start dividing the resources? In Joshua 13, 1 it says, Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years, and there remains very much of the land to possess. <laughs> Captain Obvious, yeah, you're old, you're advanced, there is, you, you've, you've conquered, you've fought the major battles, but now there's still a lot of cleanup to do. Now, you soldiers, you understand this. You might go into a situation, you might wage a battle, you might win the battle, but then there's a whole lot of clean up to do, making sure that the hot, pot, hot spots are, are squashed. There's the logistics of setting things up. There's a whole lot of operational things that need to take place. And so God says that, you know, there's much of the land that remains to be possessed. They had to do it incrementally. They wiped out the major armies. We saw the 30-some-odd the kings that were, that were crushed in the battles, and now there's the possessing of the land. And it's kind of non-glamorous stuff. In Joshua 13, verses 6b through 7, it says, The Lord says, I myself will drive them out before you, before the people of Israel. Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now, therefore, divide the land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And so what we see now is a very clear directive. They come in as a nation, but he's going to be dividing the land into the tribes. Now, we're going to look at some maps in a little bit but as we, we get into this, but what we, what we need to take note of right here is that God has set them up for success. You see, the, the battle was accomplished. The big battles were accomplished, but there was need for ongoing victory. There was a need for an ongoing victory in this process. There's a whole lot of land that needs to be possessed. The heavy load has been done, but I, the Lord, I'm going to fight on your behalf. I'm going to drive the people out before you, but they're going to have to do that. So what we see here is we see God incorporating the people of Israel in the process. They were participating in the process. Now, why did God choose to do this in this way? Because he's driving them out, but he's including them in the process of possessing the land. And the reason that he does that is because ownership comes through partnership, whereas inactivity leads to entitlement. If he would have just given it and said, hey, you don't have to possess it, then there would have been an entitlement mentality. And God didn't want them falling into an entitlement mentality where they had expectations that they were going to put demands on God every time. He said, you're my partner. I'm leading you in. I'm doing the lion's share of the work. But I want you to take possession of it. I think of when I was a, a, a little boy. I, my dad, he was a, a, a son of a sharecropper. You've heard me say this. And so he knew hard work. And he instilled that quality of hard work in my brother and me. And so we had this old uh, plow. 
and it was a, a, a steel wheel plow with woods, and it was like something that should have been hooked up to a, a, a mule or something, but my brother and I were the mule. And so uh, we would, you know, we're little guys. We're trying to push this thing to break up soil, and it doesn't work, but even with my brother and me together, we couldn't get it sometimes. And there's a funny photo of my brother holding the, the things, and I'm in the back pushing him, and we're just not making a whole lot of progress. But all it took was Dad to come out and get his hands on the plow, and even though we were plowing, he was plowing. But we were doing it together. And we had own ownership in that. So we could say, we plowed the garden. Now, who really plowed the garden? Dad plowed the garden. But we participated. And so we had ownership with that. And so when we got out there and, and helped him plant the garden, we had ownership and participation in the, in, the, in the vegetables that came out of that garden. You see, God includes people in the process so that there can be ownership versus an entitlement mentality. And that's relevant for us today. You see, God has done the lion's share of the work. He's, he saved us by grace through faith alone. On the cross, Christ did it all. But he says, work out your salvation. Not work for, but work out your salvation. It's a process as we're discovering relationship with him so that we can grow in intimacy with him. And then he's commissioned us in the Great Commission. And he sent us out into the world. But it also says that he is going before us and his spirit is convincing the world of sin and of righteous, righteousness and of judgment. And so the Lord is incorporating us in the Great Commission, participating in the process so that we can own that. And this is important for the, the people of Israel as they're settling the land because as they're participating in the process, there's also an aspect of preserving unity while expanding. As the tribes are together conquering the land, they conquered the land together. Now each tribe is having to, to possess their own land. So there was an aspect that they did together which brought about unity, but there's an aspect that each tribe had to do to finish it out which created ownership as well. God used these things together in a powerful way. And so we see in verse 33, uh, excuse me, 8 through 33, that they settled the, the land, the rest of the land. It talks about Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Israel on the east side of the Jordan River. Now, if you bring up the, the map uh, uh, that I have there, for the settling of the land, I don't know how well you can see this, but on the um, uh, east side or the right side of the Jordan River, you have uh, Reuben, and then you have Gad, and then you have Manasseh. And Manasseh was the, one of the half-tribes of Israel because Joseph, who was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, or who was renamed Israel, uh, he wasn't given a, a, a portion of the land. His two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, replace him in the land allotment. So that's why you don't see Joseph, Joseph with the coat of many colors, in all of this. Yeah, he's one of the sons, but his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, are the representation of Joseph. So when they were getting ready to cross into the land, the half-tribe of Manasseh, as you can see up there in the red, and then on the other side, they're, they're in the red in the middle as well, they said, we want part of our inheritance on the, the east side of the Jordan River. So uh, Moses said, okay. So now Joshua is doing the good job of a manager by fulfilling his responsibility to allot the land as it was promised. So he gives the portion to Reuben, a portion to Gad, and a portion to uh, Manasseh, the half-tribe of Manasseh. And so we see... The divine decentralization take place. If everybody was just living together as that one nice community in one big city, they would have really had a powerful city, but they wouldn't have been able to possess the land the way that God told them to possess the land. You see, all of this land was a promise. It was an inheritance for all of the people. And God gave that divine directive to, to, to possess the land. In order to possess it effectively, he had to partition it and divide it up. This is the role of an effective manager. Sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone to accomplish the things that God wants you to do. And yeah, they could have lived together in harmony and had a metropolis, but God said, go out and possess the land. And then it continues over in, in Joshua 14, verses 1 through 5, on the west side of the Jordan River. And where we see uh, the, all of that's on the, the Dead Sea down in the middle, that blue area, and then the Sea of Galilee up top, the straight line down is the Jordan River, and everything to the left or to the west of that covers the nine and a half tribes, the other half tribe of Manasseh, and then the other nine tribes of Israel that are there. And if you could bring up that second map, um, 
I didn't have one real good one, so I, those are, that's the same map. It's just a different color representation. I didn't know which one would, good, would be better for you. And then plus the, the tribe of Simeon that on the left map that's down there in the middle in orange, they don't have it as much delineated, but it's kind of have a, 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 a dotted circle around it on the, the, the map that's in the green area. So we see the partition of the land that takes place. Now what's interesting about this, in verse 1 of chapter 14, it says that Eliezer the priest and Joshua were in, involved in the allotment of this land. Now why is this little detail important? Because up to this time, Joshua is leading the people very effectively, but at this time, it's getting more into a managerial role. And if you know anything about Joshua, he was pretty good as a military leader. And he was really, that was his strength. And so what he does is he has Eliezer the priest come alongside of him in the process of leadership. So leadership doesn't mean that you do everything all the time, but that you select people with gifts and skills and abilities that can be complementary in order to achieve a task together. Joshua wasn't threatened by Eliezer the priest. He saw him as an asset and an ally and incorporated him into the process as well. And so we see the, a summary of the, the methodology and the distribution of the, of the different tribes. In the, this first portion of Joshua 14, 1 through 5, it says that they cast lots so that there wouldn't be any guilt. He had this, the people spy out the land so that he could make the different po portions of the land, but then they cast lots to see which portion would go to which person. It avoided the, the accusations of favoritism, which could have divided them as they're looking at this land. They were going to be trusting that God would be placing the right tribes in the right portion of land with the right brother tribe for the ultimate harmony. And so this was the process that God used. You know, I think of sometimes that transition that Nate, Nate needs to take place for things to advance in life and ministry. And I think of a, a very popular company that had their own TV show, uh, Duck Commander. You may have known him as Duck Dynasty. Well, Phil Robertson was the inventor of the duck call, which created that, that whole industry of duck commander and buck commander. But what happened is, is he, while he had a good product and he started his business, it was his son Willie who came along and was able to take it from a small business to a multi-million dollar business and become a popular TV show as well. And so sometimes... It's using the gifts and the abilities that you have to raise up others and partner with others who can take you forward together. In the church, it has to be the same way. That's why we're the body of Christ. God has brought us together with unique gifts and abilities, and we need to manage the gifts and abilities that God has given us and partner together with others so that we can accomplish God's purpose for us. His purpose is the Great Commission. Even as Elder Barry mentioned, and so articulately communicated the passion that we have as the Christian Missionary Alliance is to go to places where others are unwilling to go and to reach the unreached people groups of the world with the gospel. It requires management and organization on one level to do the, the groundwork and to be the pointy edge of the sword on the, uh, on the other end. It's a partnership together and we see following the divine directive is so important. So the question that I have for you today is how are you contributing to God's plan by your response to his directive in your life? God gives you an ability and he wants you to use that ability in the local body called the church and he wants you to use it outside of the doors of the church to reach the community. We are to proclaim Christ and so part of that is saying am I responding to the divine directive that God has given me? to use my gifts and abilities for His glory, to lead others to Christ, to share the good news, and to have harmony and, and, and as we are decentralized in achieving the goals that God has for us. Well, another factor that we look at, which is critical to both leaders and the people, um, as, uh, as in concerning the desire to finish well, is taking it to the next level. And... Um, and having a mentality of no retirement. You know, often in our culture, in our society, we look forward to retirement, we plan for retirement, and it's the ultimate goal of stopping work so that we can retire and sit back and relax. Now, please, if you have any pointy objects, 
put them away at this time. And if you have any blunt objects, please get them out of your reach so that you don't stone me or stab me. But I defy you. I dare you to prove to me and show me from Scripture where it is okay to have a mentality of retirement. Retirement for the Christian is called death. That is your retirement. And so, granted, there's a balance here. Now, our senior saints, you are not off the hook because you've done your duty. At the same time, because you've done your duty and, you've, and you're used to leading doesn't mean that you don't make place for the rising and emerging leaders. It's not an either or, it's a both and. There might be some seasons where we step back and, and take things at a little bit slower rate because as God said to Joshua, you're old. <laughs> you're old. And uh, you, I, I forgot the pre precise words that he said. You're old and advanced in years. And yeah, the older you get and the more advanced in years, you might not have the same energy, but it doesn't mean that you stop engaging in the ministry that God has called you to do. And it also means that you don't try to control things. You have to provide place to coach up and to train up the new people to step up. And so it's a both and, not an either or. It's not that we want to run out the senior saints and we don't want to, 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 to overcharge the younger ones. We want it to be a balanced working together. And that's the beauty of the body. There are seasons and cycles, and we can come together in a powerful way. But for Joshua, there was no retirement. And also we see that Caleb, the other spy who went in with Joshua, there was no retirement. Now, Caleb is an interesting fella. I'm going to read you a little bit more about him in verses 14. You're saying, if you're only on 14.6, how are you going to finish up in the next 10 minutes? Well, I've got some uh, rabbits to pull out of my proverbial uh, hat. So Joshua, he is called... Uh, um, he is confronted with Caleb, and Caleb says he wants to claim the hill country. Now, Joshua has a job of managing people at this time. We read in uh, Joshua 14, 6 through 13. You can follow along on, on screen. And then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, um, said to him, You know that the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land and brought him word again as it was in my heart. My brothers who went up with me uh, made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now because the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while um, Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85, now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. you got to love Caleb. Man, I love Caleb. This old dude is 85 years old. He says to Joshua, who's about 85 years old, remember when we went in as spies all those years ago? And Moses said, I'm promising you because you wholly trusted the Lord, I'm promising you that land. He goes, give me my hill country. Yeah, I don't care if they're Anakim up there. I don't care if they're in a fortified city, fortified city. I don't care if I'm 85 years old. The Lord strengthened me. He kept me alive, and he's given me the same strength today. I like that attitude. When I'm 85, I want to be like that. You know, nothing, nothing is more exciting than a kick-butt 85-year-old. Am I a pastor allowed to say kick-butt? Um, well, I did, so, and it's online. So Caleb, he was consistent in his courage. In verses 6 through 9, we see that he was when he was 45 years old, he did what the Lord said, he followed the Lord with all of his heart, and because he followed the Lord with all of his heart, he had a promise. 
He wholly followed the Lord when it wasn't easy. He wholly followed the Lord when it wasn't popular. Because remember what happened when they came back and they gave a good report and he and Joshua said, let's take the land. What did everybody do? They got stones and got ready to stone him. You see, there's a good reason that I said put down your stones because when you say something that challenges people to follow the Lord, sometimes it's not popular. Not only do I encourage you to put down your stones, I encourage you to be willing to say the things where others might want to stone you too. But do it not out of antagonism, but out of truth and commitment of wholeheartedly following the Lord. It's worth getting stoned if we wholeheartedly follow the Lord. But Caleb, he was not only consistent in his courage, he was confident in his conclusion. We saw that in verses uh, 10 through 3, where the Lord strengthened him. And see, when the Lord is strengthening you, even if you're 85 years old, he can give you the strength of a much younger man. He can give you the, the strength because it's not about the physical strength. It's about the spiritual vitality, and it's about the trust in the Lord who enables you and empowers you. You could be an 85-year-old and be strong in the Lord and be weak physically, but because of the strength in the Lord, he will make your opponents as weak as a 105-year-old person. Now, who are you going to pick in a fight? 105-year-old, 85-year-old. I'll, 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 I'll vote for the 85-year-old in those situations. So when we put our trust in the Lord, he works out the math in our advantage. And consequently, when you do that, we see that there is a living legacy that takes place. In verse chapter 15, now it's time to, to, to see the speed. So you're going to see me in the next five minutes, the next ten minutes, just, just go through chapter after chapter. Your head's going to be spinning. Chapter 15. We see what ha takes place with the tribe of Judah because Caleb was from the tribe of Judah. That big section, well, if you remember in your map, on the west side of the Jordan, the lower area, that was the big area of Judah that in the, the yellow-green down low. That was, Caleb was from the tribe of Judah, and it gives a specifics of how they went through town after town after town after town. Boy, they conquered that land. They did what they were supposed to do. And in the middle of chapter 15, you have this cool story. Well, I don't know whether it's cool or not. It's, let's put it this way. It's not politically correct. So Caleb says, hey, whoever conquers this, this town, I'm giving you my daughter. Giving, she, she can be your wife. So I know, ladies, that's kind of strange. But it seems like Caleb's daughter was not too put out by that because this guy conquered this town. Uh, Caleb's daughter was given to him in marriage. And so she boldly comes to her dad, Caleb, and says, give me this land and give me this spring. And Caleb says, you got it, babe. Not literally, uh, but said, here it is. It's yours. So Caleb modeled boldness. His daughter learned boldness. Ask her, ask her father for a, an inheritance among his inheritance, and he gave it to her. And so we see the, 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 the genealogy of boldness carried down through his daughter. A very powerful illustration, a legacy that takes place. Now in verse 63 of chapter 15, it says that the only place that was not conquered was the city of Jebus and the Jebusites, which is Jerusalem. Now I've got a whole theory of why that may have been. It may have been because the Lord saw that there was something among the Jebusites where they could live and they wouldn't be the cancer that all the other Canaanites were. And I will go back to the fact that Melchizedek was a, a priest from Jerusalem, and that may have been why, but that's a whole other sermon. And if you don't know who Melchizedek is, that's a homework assignment for you. I don't have time to unpack that, but you can look that up a little bit later. And that may have been a reason why that was taking place. But the, the thing that we need to ask ourselves is, uh, how, are you, how are you living both in boldness for your generation and for yourself and also in a way that is a blessing to the next generation. The way that we need to live is for boldness for ourselves and our generation, but also as a model for hope for the next generation, that they too can be conquerors the way that we're conquerors, that they too can wholly follow the Lord the way that we wholly follow the Lord. You see, Joshua, he modeled character in his management to help the people to better understand both patterns and power. The patterns which can be detrimental need to be overcome, and the power which God gives us to overcome those detrimental, power, those detrimental patterns. 
We see the divine directive in part one about managing uh, the, the distribution. In the second part, with no retirement, we saw about managing the people with Caleb. In this section, with the power and the patterns, we're seeing about managing the infrastructure. There was an effective organizational, operational organization that took place as they enter into the land. And we see this taking place. They, were, they had a problem. The children of Israel had a problem. And that problem was with the possessing of the land. And what Joshua does as a good manager is he calls them into accountability. They are called to accountability to define, to follow God's divine directive. They're called into accountability to live boldly the way that Caleb lived boldly. They're called into accountability. Because what they had done is they had disregarded a clear command of God and they had fallen into compromise. The clear command is found in, in Joshua 16.10. It says, however, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. They were told to drive them out, to drive them out completely because they would be a snare. But they didn't drive them out of the area of Ephraim. They let them stay, and then they put them into forced labor. So they compromised. So rather than driving them out, either wiping them out through battle or chasing them completely out of the land, if they stayed and fought, they would die, and they were told to wipe them out. If they fled, they would have to leave the land completely. But they, they compromised, and they put them into forced labor. So rather than driving them out, they adopted a form of slavery, which was dishonoring to God's direct command, his clear command. And that would become a snare for them because as they think, hey, we'll keep them around and use them, they ended up learning their idolatrous practices, which became a spiritual snare for the nation of Israel. So we see this disregard for a clear command in, in Joshua 16.10, but we also see it again in Joshua 17, verses 12-13. through 13. Not only did it happen in Ephraim, it happened in Manasseh. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but, they, but did not utterly drive them out. Compromise will be the death of us. When we compromise on spiritual things out of expediency, it often results in something that will become a cancer and undermine our spiritual well-being and health. What are the areas where you're tempted to compromise in your walk with the Lord which can cause spiritual damage to the condition of your soul? We need to utterly deal with those things, not play around, but deal with it definitively. Because if we let those things hang around, if we try to say, well, we'll just leverage it for our advantage for forced labor, it's going to ultimately come back to have a detrimental impact not only on us personally, but on the next generation and on the community, both physically and spiritually. This is a danger that we need to be aware of. But we also see not only did they have disobedience to a direct command, and that's why God didn't drive the people out before them because they're operating in disobedience. If they had operated in obedience, the Lord said he would drive them out. But they also had delayed obedience. They were delaying in implementing the clear process that God had given them. Joshua had encouraged them in engagement. He was holding them accountable to the, follow the command, but when, when they were delaying, he was encouraging them to engage in what God told them to do. You know, there is a, a real danger if we make the mistake of thinking something is a symbiotic relationship where both parties are, are mutually benefiting and it's a parasitic relationship. Because symbiotic means that we benefit and there's a mutual benefit. And the tribes of Israel were living in symbi symbiotic relationship, unique tribes, but blessing one another. But the Canaanites were more of a parasitic relationship and were going to contaminate the people. And so they were trying to leverage and take these people in the land and let it become symbiotic when it was parasitic and was damaging to them. And so their delayed obedience was also part of this parasitic pattern that they had. We see in Joshua 18, verse 3, Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land, which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Joshua's saying, hey, God's given it to you. What are you waiting for? Go get it. Why are you putting this off? So he calls them 
to engage and to do that, but they didn't. Joshua, it's interesting. Because Joshua, the manager, even though the people didn't do their job, it didn't keep him from doing his job. It said in verse 10 of that same chapter that Joshua cast lots for them at Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua apportioned the land to the people of Israel, each to his portion, even though they were slow in going to possess it. He said, hey, if you're not going to go get it, I'm just going to tell you where to go, and it's on you now. And so when we have something that we need to do, and it involves others, an other person's failure to do their part that should not hinder us from doing what God has clearly commanded us to do as well. Yes, it might have an implication. It might be, have a negative implication for us, but it doesn't mean that we're going to stop doing what God has called us to do. You know, you can be in charge of the things that God has commanded you to do, even if everybody else is walking in disobedience. And that's how Caleb was able to receive the inheritance and boldly take it with vitality at age 85 the way that he did. So as we, we look at this whole aspect, a couple of weeks ago when Josh Norris was preaching, he talked about a delayed obedience is disobedience. We see that coming out again here with this delay, delayed obedience. And so the question is, why do we disregard and delay obedience to God's clear command? And I think sometimes it's because we fear change or there's a fear of the unknown. So often it's easy to engage in the commands that God has given us because we don't want to separate. We don't want to expand. We don't want to grow. And for a small church like Cross U, it would be easy to say, well, I like the people that are here. I don't want to grow. That means new people will come in. But our mandate is to preach the gospel so that others can become a part of the family of God. And so we want to grow, and we want to grow in a healthy way so that others can come to know Jesus. That's our call and our mandate, and that can be scary. How are we going to deal with somebody that I don't know? Well, you'll get to know them the same way that you knew the people that were here. And so that's why we want to be inclusive and reaching out and growing the family and getting to know one another and understanding that everybody's not going to know everybody all the time, but that doesn't mean that we can't live in community and harmony because we are bound together by God who calls us and God who empowers us. Just to wrap things up, we see in verses, um, the rest of the, the chapters, uh, we, lo lost a, uh, verse, uh, we left off in verse 18, but 19 and following, we see the, the promises, the provision and the promises. See, God made promises and he kept promises and he secured justice for all. We see that he dealt with the remaining six tribes in Joshua chapter 19. We see a details about the distribution of those, those remaining six tribes. And then verse 20, we see cities of refuge where God had established cities where people could go to if there was some problem and there was death and murder that took place or, 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 or accidental killings. It says that a manslayer, a person who strikes a person without intent or knowingly can flee to these cities of refuge. And he gives the details about three cities on the east side of Jerusalem and three cities on the west side, excuse me, of the east side of Jordan and three cities on the west side of Jordan so that people could have places to go to. So he made some organizational structural provision for the people to live in harmony. Then he in, ver in chapter 21, he gives details about the, the legacy of the Levites and how the Levites are one of the 12 tribes of Israel, but they're not getting in a land allotment, but they get cities. And the Levites were the, the priestly class. And so he wanted to make sure that there was a spiritual influence throughout all of the land so that they wouldn't be influenced by the, the idolatrous practices of those people who used to live there. So that's why the Levites were given cities all throughout the 12 different tribes of Israel so that there could be a, a, an assurance of a spiritual reckoning. And then we see finally that within these 48 Levite cities, we see the conclusion of Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 through 45. It says, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to them, to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as He had sworn to their fathers. Not one of, of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Pass. You see, God is a promise keeper. If there was a problem with the implementation, it was because of the people's aspect of the partnership that God had entrusted him but God kept his promises of driving them out and when they walked in obedience they drove them out utterly this, as we saw with the tribe of Judah under the guidance of, of Caleb their, their patriarch. You see character forged in times of crisis will be revealed 
in times of success. And we see the positive aspects and we see the negative aspects of that. So as managers, as of, of stewards that God has called us, we need to make sure that we are living into the high calling that he has given us of obedience versus the disobedience which leads us to become bad managers. So what is your next step? Well, if you've never come to Jesus, that's the next step because Christ is the beginning of a relationship with God which leads us to peace with God and to accomplish the purposes that he has for us. If you're a Christ follower, then your next step might be to, to, to repent of a retirement mentality and engage in the work that he's called you to do. If you're a, a young believer, it might be saying, I'm not going to look and wait for, for, for the Caleb's, the 85-year-olds to do it. I'm going to step up and, and learn under them and begin to take on the responsibilities that I can. You see, there's a place for everybody in the, uh, in the body of Christ, the young and the old. And that's why for membership, it starts at 16. So if we have 16-year-olds who want to become members of the church, you are more than welcome to do that. We will find you a place to serve. But the good news is, is that God calls us to stewardship and management, and he equips us, and it's all about his kingdom purposes, to advance the kingdom of God. And so this isn't just a story about conquering the land. This is a message for us today, to boldly step out like Caleb did, to be faithful in bringing people alongside you to, in areas of weakness the way that Joshua did with uh, Eliezer the priest, but advancing the kingdom because the lost are lost without Jesus. And we can be a part of the solution in these last days. Let us pray.